Hello, everybody. My name is Thomas Mejorais. I'm a political scientist and I'm finishing my master's thesis this year. I used to write analytical articles uh, on Middle East and North Africa on public broadcasting of Latvia, LSM. And this interview is a part of series that is closely linked with the annual Riga conference, which is organized by the Latvian Transatlantic Organization in, co in cooperation with both the Ministry of Defense and the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of the Republic of Latvia. The aim of this series is to keep the discussions going in between the conferences. Today, my guest is Frederick Sozols, a political observer specializing in the Middle East and a journalist. This time, uh, the topic is about uh, the Israeli-Palestine conflict, which has a long and complex history. However, in the last few weeks, uh, the violence has escalated, bringing it into the headlines again. Both sides do not, do not seem keen on giving up, but casualties are mounting on the side of Palestinians, and there is a looming hum humanitarian crisis for the people of uh, Gaza Strip. Without any further introduction, uh, perhaps you, Frederick, can tell us how did it come to this situation, and after that, we can look at more detailed questions. I believe it's better to begin with uh, with exact questions because um, the subject we're going to cover today uh, it's a subject you would usually need like years and years and years, not only days, because there's so much to talk uh, to talk about, and and there are so many misconceptions about the subject as well. So hopefully we will be able to pin some points down and perhaps to clear up something in the minds of our listeners. However, it would be, uh, I, I wouldn't be able to claim that I'm really, you know, uh, the master of all keys uh, to the knowledge of this uh, conflict. I believe there's no person uh, li living who uh, who would be able to untangle that. Um, okay, so um, I think then let's start with like a, a domestic question about like what's the relations between Hamas, which has been declared as a terrorist organization by many Western countries, and the Palestine, Palestinian National Authority. Noting that in 2007, uh, Hamas forcefully took over the Gaza Strip, and there have been cases of them not recognizing the leadership and officials of Palestinian National Authority. How has this com conflict impacted the power dynamics of them at the moment and so on? Um, again, in fact, this question is um, much broader than that, uh, because basically we come back to two notions which are terribly important when we are analyzing Middle East and the wider Middle East also, and the oneness of nationalism and the Arab nationalism, and the, uh, um, um, so sorry, I lost my, <laughs> just began my thread of thought and, and, and so it was. So the one is uh, Arab nationalism, yes. And, the, um, and another one is um, Islam as a foundation of uh, uh, Arab state. Um, as a real foundation, like a Muslim state in a way. And these two forces are um, almost always at play when, when we are dealing especially with the conflict in Palestine. So what we have here is uh, not exactly Palestinian Authority or Palestinian National Authority, but we would perhaps better go back to Palestinian liberation um, organization as an uh, organ umbrella organization, uh, which came out from um, Arabic League. And that organization, at least as it is, well, since, let's say, 1988, we would view as... Um, like with nationalistic agenda. So it's like national Palestine. However, uh, there was another organization. Well, there is still Muslim Brotherhood and Muslim Brotherhood as an organization, which in fact is much more related to Egypt, but the offshoot Palestinian Muslim Brotherhood has this uh, very Islamic agenda and this um, 
this organization transformed itself into uh, further two organizations, one of which, and the leading one, is Hamas. Now, from the Palestinian uh, uh, liberation organization, um, there comes another element, which we know as Fatah. And uh, this Fatah, uh, as a party with much more national agenda, uh, Palestinian nationalism, uh, is dominating Palestinian authority. Now, since 2006, um, there, uh, like, uh, the differences between the organizations have become so um, irreconcilable that uh, we have a situation which is now that Western Bank is um, under the leadership of Palestinian Authority, which is dominated by Fatah, and there is this national agenda. And this Islamic agenda uh, and Hamas is ruling Gaza Strip. So those two principal uh, territories in um, uh, occupied territories within the boundaries of modern state of um, Israel, which are populated by Palestinians. Um, yeah, and uh, uh, like trying to expand on like the Hamas and Gaza Strip, the situation there, um, Correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, uh, the Gaza Strip uh, has its borders closed and, uh, and they are heavily regulated from both Egypt and Israel. So my question would be uh, specifically about Hamas is how does Hamas manage to keep itself self-sufficient and even armed when ordinary citizens, most of them refugees living in the Gaza Strip are struggling to provide basic needs for themselves? Well, <laughs> there is that uh, well-known idea of uh, tunnels um, uh, through which you can move all the things you can imagine. I remember that was many years ago, National Geographic, uh, uh, I subscribed to that uh, uh, magazine and uh, they had an article on those tunnels actually. And um, I remember they I didn't know if that was a picture or or that was in the uh, text which accompanied that, but there was, you can smuggle even cars inside. So um, to smuggle a rocket launcher or basically things you need to, um, uh, to make that rocket launcher, uh, that's not a big deal. Uh, besides, you are talking about those closed borders. Well, um, so there are, if I remember correctly, again, I'm not into that much of detail, but if I remember correctly, there are seven border crossings, uh, six of which are on Israeli side. And one of them uh, is on the Egyptian side. So uh, I, of course, I, I'm not claiming that, that really everything is being smuggled through Egypt. No, not, not necessarily, you know. Smugglers, <laughs> they are super efficient in, in their ordeal. And uh, Talking about those, uh, you know, you know you're, you're saying, you know, that um, civ or you're implying rather that civilian population is uh, suffering. Uh, however, they still have those, uh, you know, weapons in, in, in absolutely sufficient amounts uh, to with those attacks which they are doing. Um, well, that's something that Israel is always blaming them for. That's what they are saying. For example. Uh, something like fairly recently anyhow, I heard, you know, one of those things uh, that were raised was this uh, latest conflict was um, that, you know, there is the rise of COVID cases also in the Gaza Strip and and, and situation is, is far from good, ne never been for so many decades and uh, and that Israelis are not doing enough. <laughs> but Israel said, well, um, firstly, uh, you have your own Palestinian authority to deal with the issues on the ground. That's, that's, that's your responsibility. And secondly, why do you spend all that money on weapons? Well, do something for your people, you know, for education, for uh, uh, health, for uh, for every, uh, 
residential buildings and things like that, you know, for a, for a peaceful life. That's, that's precisely what, what, Israeli, um, what Israel is, is blaming uh, Palestinians, especially like Hamas, uh, for. Hmm. And uh, now, like moving slowly towards like uh, uh, Israel politics, we have to take into account that uh, the current prime minister uh, uh, of Israel, Benjamin Netanyahu, has been having trouble of forming co a coalition. There has been there have been four elections in the last two years, and as well, he's been a part of a long and ongoing corruption investigation and a possible court. Uh, situation. So how does this conflict impact the situation, like the political situation in Israel domestically? And how could it maybe uh, evolve? Could there be like more radicalization of like far right uh, Israeli groups or more like left leaning and so on? There is uh, some sort of um consensus among some part of uh, scholars and observers that uh, uh, that it's uh, you know everything goes down to the personality of Benjamin Netanyahu uh, I, I find it a bit difficult to uh, accept this um, simplification of the matter most of the things and uh, I've looked into what Benjamin Netanyahu did and, and talked uh, as far as, and you can do that yourself on the YouTube, there is a, an interesting piece of video where Benjamin Netanyahu and uh, uh, by the surname of Nitaizen uh, was talking in 1978, yet as a student, he had participated in two wars um, already himself, but uh, nonetheless, he was still I believe, 28 years uh, of age. What he was saying back then is uh, largely the same what he's saying now, and that is um, part and parcel of Zionism, uh, and by Zionism I imply uh, Israeli nationalism um, and not those like um, uh, additional connotations, negative connotations that uh, very often are ascribed to that. That's, that's just a term, if, if taken uh, merely, that's just a term for Israeli nationalism. And, and um, so there, there would be the same idea still. They, they are looking for, or they are awaiting for, or they are blaming Palestinians for not accepting the existence of the state of Israel. And they are saying that this is a major um, prerequisite uh, for anything to happen. And if you do not accept the existence of the state of Israel, um, then we sort of are not able to move forward. However, and, and I mean, I also understand where your question comes from. Uh, there is also this understanding, of, after all, being a politician, you have to form a coalition and uh, to form that coalition, you have, um, even if that was not part of your political agenda yourself, eventually you give into and you lean towards certain directions, uh, which perhaps were not exactly part of your own political agenda. So um, naturally, he's relying on uh, uh, like more uh, rightist and, and uh, far rightist as we would sort of call those political uh, powers, you know, in order to form that coalition. Uh, however, it, it still remains to be seen how successful all that is going to be. Um, nonetheless, essentially, his position hasn't changed. And that's not only his position. I mean, um, even with part of those um, left, uh, left politicians or uh, thinkers uh, in Israel society, you would still hear the same idea that Palestinians have to accept the very existence of the state of Israel. And it sounds very sort of natural in a way. However, it, it's not that natural when it comes from, um, when you look at that issue from a Palestinian perspective. Because um, when you recognize the existence of the state of Israel, that's essentially Jewish state. 
So, so that changes the whole mindset, and that that implies a lot of those things which Palestinians are against now because it is Jewish state. You know, we, we, we sort of we tend to disregard the Jewish uh, part from that. So it is Jewish state. However, of course, there are also other nationalities living there, like Jews, like uh, Arab Israelis, and uh, uh, Christians uh, from all walks and and whatever uh, and, and ethnicities. Nonetheless, it is Jewish state, and they ask for that fact to be accepted. Um, if if it's if that's not accepted, they say they can't go forward. However, in my understanding, uh, from what we have seen so far, and we have seen a lot <laughs> over the uh, 20th century, and already now in the 20 years in the 21st century, I'm not even sure that. Well, first of all, what do you mean by accepting a uh, Jewish state? Um, uh, apparently, you ask for something more than lip service of saying that, well, we accept that there is a Jewish state, you know. Um, so you would need, in essence, some 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 proofs uh, for that. Um, you would need to have altered um, Palestinian mentality, perhaps. Uh, something which much more corresponds uh, with Israeli uh, expectation from Palestinians, which does not necessarily correspond to their own uh, vision of themselves or, or how they have. So, so you see, um, I I wouldn't necessarily agree with an idea that uh, Benjamin Netanyahu is far right and that he is uh, totally relying on them. However, there are reasons why uh, both of the parties, both Israelis and Palestinians, are becoming more and more radical. One of the reasons um, is demographics. For um, demographical pattern among Israelis and among Palestinians uh, implies that, um, um, especially among Israelis, you would see like, uh, among secular Jews, there are uh, not that many children and families being born. Those big families are usually in um, among religious population um, and among, even if not religious, then, um, but there are, you know, there are also all sorts of, of grades and shades in between of uh, well very like zionist population but but here i would imply still uh, some sort of of uh, uh, of of religious coloration to that so so these are those families which uh, which in fact gives a positive um a trends uh, to uh, demographical situation in israel so naturally if if your electoral base is growing because of those demographic trends. So you would see more of those um, rightist and far rightist, well, but these are really, um, uh, I mean, those terms are, are very misleading, especially if we take like what far right, for example, stands for in our understanding, uh, I mean, from a Western perspective, um, that, that's, that really might be very misleading uh, in the case of Israel, but nonetheless. Um, so um, there would, you would see those positive trends, there you would see this growing electoral base and naturally more of a political power and that would clash against um, similar tendencies on the Palestinian side, where you would see um, a greater uh, increase of population. And uh, if you look at the demographic trends, you would see that especially Gaza Strip, uh, the average age is very, very low, like 40 something. So you would see like um, big families, um, and and predominantly young people, uh, and um, uh, huge impact of of uh, so like religious tendencies, uh, this uh, religious uh, currents. So um, again, that's inevitable. One of those uh, areas where the clash is um, inadvertent, but uh, yes, well. I believe Benjamin Netanyahu is just uh, taking that into account and trying to play uh, 
uh, real po uh, uh, real politic <laughs> yes here indeed it may be so but internationally it does look a bit uh, well, let's say it doesn't look good internationally uh, even though like building on like the last question there has been an ongoing uh, process of Israel detaining and arresting all those Palestinian citizens of Israel that have been taking part in protests against the military bombardment of Gaza Strip, the crackdown of the mosque of Al-Aqsa when it happened uh, a week or two ago, and against uh, the settler violence in the West Bank. How do you view this action and 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 uh, that Israel is like detaining the obviously like targeting only that one specific demographic uh, of people in the territory, even though there have been protesters around the world uh, and even from the Jewish community against Israel's asymmetric use of, uh, violence, of force in the conflict. So uh, j just sort of to understand, beg your pardon for, for not per perhaps uh, getting the question entirely right. So your idea is, uh, what's my idea of uh, use of force by the side of Israel against against uh... Uh, against like specifically the like the Palestinian citizens of Israel, like Israeli Palestinians in that sense. They have been partaking uh, into pro like into protests against the uh, I, I wouldn't uh, I think I think well again to understand that in perspective um, first of all we are speaking of at least you no know, three four at least four types of uh, different territories because Israel is really a patchwork so there is one situation in the West Bank which is unlike the situation in the Gaza Strip, because Gaza Strip yes. is an entirely different situation. And very often people do not understand that. They use the term Palestinians, or they use um, like this uh, very vague phrase of Israelis using force against Palestinians. However, that is misleading because um, more often than not, Israelis are, are not doing anything in, you know, in regards of West Bank, for example. So as for uh, Gaza Strip, you would usually see, because since the withdrawal from the Gaza Strip, which was again a landmark event, I believe 2005 was it, Israelis are not going into the, you know, you've closed the border. It is, I mean, Land incursion is possible, but thanks God it, it didn't happen and, and we are not uh, going there, most probably. Uh, other than that, there are those targeted rocket attacks. Well, whatever you do, you know, mostly you use like some, all of those systems you can use uh, uh, from the aircraft, from uh, targeted rocket attacks and things like that. Even then, you would still try to do as little damage as possible. Um, they really do quite hard job, first of all, to document those things then uh, in the very process of decision making, and then in communicating those almost each and every strike to the international society. Uh, from that perspective, we see that this process is like very strict from Israeli side and absolutely indiscriminate from um, Palestinian side. You know, you can really shower Israel with, uh, with a huge amount of rockets and, and you don't care where do they fall. Um, there are civilian casualties. They are rare if we believe um, uh, what Israelis are saying. And uh, usually they happen uh, if something goes wrong, or if, as is uh, mostly the case, uh, if Hamas is using civilian buildings and civilians as a shield uh, against Israelis. And there is a whole martyr culture, actually, uh, on the Palestinian side. Uh, let's not also forget that there is, I don't like the term, but... Um, it's very telling. Uh, usually those pro-Israeli scholars use the term pay for slay, which is um, 
In fact, there are at least two types of payments uh, which Palestinian Authority hands out. Uh, so one is for Palestinians being imprisoned for security reasons, but also for, for all other reasons, even for uh, theft and things like that. So they receive monthly payments, like, like a wage, salary. And then there is a martyr's fund. So for each and every one killed, you also get payment, the family gets payment, and, and that goes on. And the amounts are huge. I mean, um, that those, well, you know, we have like scattered information in that regard, not much detailed, but um, we sometimes see numbers being mentioned like around thousand dollars a month for a person in jail uh, in Israel, um, which is, um, now if we think into that, Imagine um, those poor employment opportunities, uh, which they have. I'm sorry to say, but for some of the families that has been part of their culture, um, this martyr culture goes on, it takes deep roots. And you really have like uh, thinking, I remember our teacher also, uh, when I was studying Asia studies at the Latvian University, um, he was also, he, he went to Israel, he spent quite a time there, you know, so doing some sort of a research. And I remember he had the same information. I mean, we read it first of all in, in most of the books devoted to the subject, but, but he also had it, uh, you know, from meeting both Palestinians and Israelis, that indeed it's very often the case that you have like uh, three, four sons even, family and because one will be killed the other one will get into jail and so the third one will be the one who will care for the family it uh, i mean we we shall not of course take that uh, those statements like i just made uh, without a pinch of salt and uh, we really have to look at them in perspective and it would be extremely wrong to think of uh, Palestinians as uh, people who are sort of, you know, um, Islamic terrorists, God forbid. No, they are not. Uh, Two thirds of Palestinians are really, I mean, surveys are showing that, are peace loving people. However, on that remaining side, and especially this culture is widespread in the Gaza Strip, um, there is extremely um, high sense of um, that any attack towards Israel as state, including Jewish population, is um, is like you know okay, it's it's for the good deal you know, for, for a good cause. If you have this culture, it's terribly difficult to go on from that point. And um, this has been always downplayed because uh, the fight which, or the conflict we see there in the Middle East, for some reason, it's approached like a fairy tale where you have uh, one good hero and, and then another one, a bad one. And now the fight is between those two, which is not the case. On each of the parts of this conflict, we see civilian population, we see politicians, we see militaries and things like that. Um, each of those parts in this conflict have certain well-grounded rights to be there. And those rights, uh, by, by rights, we mean that uh, each and every person in the world uh, has been entitled to some, first of all, universal human rights. And secondly, if you are living in your state, that state should not come under constant attack from a uh, hostile population of uh, another state, even if it is occupied and within your boundaries. Now, uh, I mentioned only Gaza Strip and West Bank, but then you have Jerusalem, which is divided, and there is uh, Arab part, where majority of, of uh, Arab population lives, and the so-called Jewish part. So that is, again, something else, because um, a lot of people do not understand that 
when they refer to Palestinians by this common term, Palestinians, they fail to recognize that there are uh, those who are in the Gaza Strip, those who are in the West Bank, and then there are Arab Israelis. And that's in, that is entirely different story again, because Arab Israelis are citizens of Israel with all the rights that the citizens of Israel have. That's a different thing. They are not population of occupied territories. They are really citizens of Israel. They can vote, they can be elected, and they are elected, uh, they are in Knesset, they are among, uh, uh, in, in the ranks of academia, um, um, at the level of, of uh, uh, municipal governments, and, and so on and so forth. That's something else. Now, this latest conflict, as has been the case also before, has stirred, and especially the reaction which you see. But um, we must not forget also of the play, uh, of the role media play um, when conflicts like that happen. So um, in some other cities uh, with uh, big or even majority Arab population like uh, Akko in the north, Haifa, um, and uh, there were some others. Of course, you would see great dissatisfaction among the Arab, speak, uh, um, the Arab speakers, no, I mean, uh, Arab Israelis. Um, and in some cases, um, that uh, the dissatisfaction and that, um, that reaction towards uh, this escalation of the conflict uh, turned, I would not perhaps use the word violent. Um, it was not perhaps that case. I mean, when there was a second intifada, that was the case uh, often, but um, usually in those cities, this, co uh, this, this life is, is, I've been myself to have two years ago, and um, really the daily life is very, very okay. You would you would go to uh, typically um, Israelis with, uh, with uh, I mean, Jewish Israelis with even with kippahs and I mean, there's no problem to attend uh, Arab market, for example, because of the fresh uh, vegetable and fruit produce and uh, to shop in their shops and, and, and vice versa. I mean, there's really no, no that much of a problem, but when the emotions get high, as it is now, of course, you see different things. Uh, I've seen video myself, and apparently that was the case, but that didn't fit into any of the narratives either, where, um, well, yes, um, uh, apparently um, some fairly, uh, fairly uh, at least nationalistic, uh, maybe religious, well, most probably uh, religious uh, Jewish citizens went out um, in some sort of a protest or, or, or rally or whatever, but, but that was not like sort of, you know, big and peaceful, but rather in a way they, 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 they looked much more like a mob. And then they started attacking uh, a driver and uh, in the internet, uh, that video was shared well, thousands and thousands and thousands of viewers all around the world. And it was shared saying that um, Jewish mob is attacking um, Arabic um, uh, Arab driver, which was not the case. Actually, they attacked Jewish driver. Uh, but apparently they didn't know that he is Jewish, but anyhow, that didn't fit in any of the narratives, that didn't fit well in, in the Palestinian narrative, because that was still Jewish driver, it was not Arab driver, and that didn't fit well in the Jewish narrative, because uh, he didn't do any, anything wrong, and, and they would attack him, apparently, if he would be Arab driver as well, because he's, he thought that he is, you know. So, uh, you would see things like that, those flare-ups, you would see around Israel, uh, but um, the perhaps, especially outside this um, holy basin uh, area of the of the Jerusalem, where this Al-Aqsa Mosque compound is situated as well, 
uh, outside of the, you, you wouldn't see, uh, more often than not, you would not see really violent um, clashes or things like that. That's, 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 not, that's not really uh, what Israel is about, no. Okay, thank you. Uh, but now I would like to bring it more like the uh, questions to more like international uh, players. Like, how do you evaluate the arrival and remarks of the United States Secretary of State, Anthony Blinken, in regards to his statements about helping to rebuild the Gaza Strip and also reopening previously closed Palestinian consulate in Jerusalem? Uh, but at the same time, uh, United States has reaffirmed that they are completely committed to Israel's security and right to self-defense. So could this message uh, discourage uh, both like Hamas and national, uh, the Palestinian National Authority and other groups to discourage them from pursuing peace and uh, holding the ceasefire? Again, oh, we, are, we are back to that issue of um, um, uh, of that misleading uh, term Palestinians because yeah. um, but but that's really something huge because uh, indeed a lot of scholars uh, do not recognize the importance of that issue um, remember that we haven't had elections in uh, West Bank if I'm right since 2006 they are always postponed for different reasons. And uh, I think they were to happen this year. And again, they are postponed naturally because of fears that Hamas, which is uh, largely continuation of this um, uh, Muslim agenda, well, Islamic agenda uh, would win also and take over West Bank. and. Uh, that would leave us in a very, very difficult situation. And by the way, not only Israel, because uh, when people are talking, you know, always like this Palestinian is Israel, Palestinian and Israel, but you have to remember that um, uh, uh, there was a civil war, well, this Black September uh, in Jordan, uh, Jordan, yes, that would, well, that would amount largely for a civil war because like of um, Palestinian population going against a king of uh, Jordan, you know, and trying to take over the, uh, the whole state. So it's, it's really, you have to remember that um, Fatah and, I mean, even if you take only those two designations, but there are much more than that. Even if you take only Fatah as a dominant force in uh, Palestinian Authority and Hamas in the Gaza Strip, even like their rivalry uh, prohibits us from using a term Palesti Palestinian or, or, or Palestine, because, because what do we really imply by that? So, um, reconstruction of Gaza Strip is extremely welcome thing. I mean, especially for the population of Gaza. On the other hand, population of Gaza is, you know, uh, I don't like uh, Israel sometimes like mm, blaming uh, the civilians in the Gaza Strip for saying, well, you know, you, you, you just, you, you have to sort of, you know, work with your leadership and you have to stop them from doing what they are doing and you have to make them to care about you. You cannot do that because of this uh, whole ethos which is going on in the Gaza Strip. You, you cannot raise against everyone. I mean, and, and that is the feel when you are the, I mean, like, you know, you cannot just come out and say oh let's 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 change everything let's become peaceful let's just grow olives let's uh, let's you know stop those rocket attacks and and things like that oh, you would be perhaps uh, either you would be pronounced mad or you would be shot because of you know don't know what's wrong with you then so there is this whole ethos uh, and you cannot stop that uh, either you reconstruct or rebuild whatever you have there, that, that's really a good thing for civilian populations there. But that might not mean much because uh, a lot of money will go 
to pay for those, uh, to pay salaries for, for militia, basically, to put it simply. And a lot of money would go to buy weapons and to go on with weaponizing, to, to build tunnels. Uh, um, after all, see how that's not about Gaza Strip anymore, but for example, West Bank, they use also money or, or used to do that. I remember even Latvian journalists participated into that. So they make even like um, media events, like you, you bring journalists over and, and you carry them around the West Bank and, and you tell your own perspective. That all takes money. You know, you, you spend that money here. And whenever your population comes and says, well, what about schools? What about vaccine against COVID-19? What about, um, uh, uh, you know, healthcare and things like that? You would say, well, we don't have money. Well, you know that we are occupied and, and we are under the occupation and you know how, how Israel treats us. I mean, of course, I mean, if you are a population of an occupied territory, um, you don't, you, naturally, you do not feel that comfortable as Israelis living in their own country, you know, on their own rights and things like that. Nonetheless, some of the things you really could do much, much better and you, you would be able to improve the lives of your people. However, that would imply, in a way, confirming uh, uh, with, with Israelis' uh, agenda. And, and that is, of course, something they, uh, that's not acceptable for them. Merely because, you know, Israel is, 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 is an occupant, you know, so, so you, you cannot sort of, you know, say that, oh, well, you are right. Yes, well, I will get down, you know, to improving healthcare and education and things like that, you know. No. Yeah. And, but what about uh, of other international players, like... Uh... Russia, especially European Union, or even regional actors like Turkey, Iran, and Saudi Arabia. What's, what are their interests and reaction to this escalated conflict at the moment? You know that issue of, um, of, of Palestine, um, that has been a, a cornerstone of um, policies uh, around even the wider Middle East. Um, I remember, for example, you know, you have two countries with um, very important, uh, like one country is with, uh, with Muslim majority and it's Islamic country, Pakistan, and the other country is neighboring India, which still has a very, very, very important Muslim uh, population. And now you position yourself in terms, you know, uh, sort of um, that Palestine, the issue of Palestine um, really helps you to establish your own position on the stage of Middle Eastern policies. So for Pakistan, uh, Palestine is occupied and, and Israel is an occupant and things like that. And for India, they kept silent largely on that. They were sort of, you know, there were indications uh, they would think like that, but still, you know, not entirely. Uh, because of that, there were no, uh, no fruitful relationships uh, possible between the countries. Now, India has changed that stance. And since then, uh, Narendra Modi made his uh, state visit uh, to Israel and uh, countries are really embarking upon um, quite successful cooperation in many areas uh, because Israel has technologies, things uh, that so many other countries need. Um, now, why I'm saying this, it means that the very issue of how you position yourself against the issue of Palestine is helping you sort of to, 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 to gain certain credibility, for example, in terms of, of, of your electoral base. For Talibs in Afghanistan, it would be absolutely impossible to accept Israel, for example. 
Likewise for Iran, it's impossible to accept Israel. Um, moreover, uh, there is another component to that issue. Uh, what's your attitude towards, for example, is there a single state solution or two state solution? Well, since Oslo Accords, we are talking about two state solution. However, my feeling is that this is largely uh, off the table uh, for, for some time already. So for Iran, although this two state solution is impossible, for other countries, two state solution is more or less viable solution. So um, um, there is another projection, which you also in a way raised. Now you asked about Saudi Arabia. So for Iran, which is an arch rival of uh, uh, and arch enemy of Saudi Arabia and vice versa, for Iran, Israel is impossibility. So it has to disappear. It has to be driven out in the sea and things like that and total destruction. And, and, and Palestine is, is essentially uh, Muslim majority with, 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 with other nations uh, on their terms living with that. Now for Saudi Arabia, however, and that happened, first of all, that started gradually over the years that was building up. And then it, it became sort of open uh, for Saudi Arabia, for uh, United Arabian Emirates, for some other countries in the region, um, they have indicated uh, that not only they accept existence of Israel as such, however, not always um, being very sort of, you know, uh, open about what's their vision of uh, territory of Israel, of Israel to be, because uh, we still understand and everyone sort of more or less adheres to that, um, that, that the issue of West Bank and Gaza Strip has to be resolved at some point and somehow, however, with very different scenarios possible. So for Arab states, uh, existence of uh, Israel, of Jewish state, has become not only a reality, which was for some time already uh, accepted reality, but, uh, but also something they can really work with. Um, like there was uh, recently, I participated only digitally, of course, as it is nowadays due to the COVID. Um, um, there was a major event in terms of um, economic cooperation between uh, United Arabian Emirates and, and, and Israel. So um, there are those very, very welcome developments. Um, nonetheless, each and every party will have to position itself. So now you asked about Turkey. And that's, again, something a bit complicated. And we know that um, since attack uh, on Khashoggi, um, the Saudi journalist uh, in the Saudi embassy in uh, Turkey. Uh, it has become very open. Uh, I mean, we see it openly that there is huge tension between uh, Turkey and Saudi Arabia. And um, I, I would be very, very careful about uh, predicting the future of that. However, I, I'm still waiting for more developments to come. I, I'm, I don't think that, you know, just because it disappeared from media agenda, from international media agenda, that the issue resolved itself. Saudi Arabia is not that important country, by the way, when we are talking about Middle East. Um, I would still agree that it, there are three countries which are indeed very important, which is Iran, Turkey, and Israel. These are the ones who steals the show, uh, who dominate uh, the headlines, and who really produce, um, uh, either deliberately or not, um, produce certain developments in the Middle East. So I suspect there is more to come from the side of Turkey. Um, the relationships between Turkey and Israel has become very, very complicated lately because they used to be quite, quite constructive, even friendly. I remember flying Turkish Airlines and um, 
that was also an airline of choice for many Israelis. Uh, well, that, that, that part is over. So, um, also, by the way, uh, Al-Aqsa compound, this Waqf, this uh, religious foundation, uh, which uh, um, uh, provides um, funds uh, for, for, for those sacred places and also for uh, uh, people and charity and things like that. That's also, I think, largely dominated by Turkey now. Um, I don't expect that any of these might support Hamas for obvious reasons. Um, since I mentioned that Hamas is a development of Muslim Brotherhood, uh, the idea of this um, Islamic State is very interesting. Um, initially, of course, they are against uh, states which are tailored um, on the Western pattern, like, you know, Israel, of course. However, eventually, they do not agree on the legitimacy of their own uh, sort of, you know, rulers because they insist on Quran and they insist on Sharia law. And eventually they demand caliph, you know, at the end of that, you must, uh, you must take away all those uh, state institutions which have been based on this uh, Western paradigm. Because of that, even Saudi kingdom which we think of or which we tend to think of as something which would be perhaps viewed by Muslims around the world as, I don't know, um, Vatican City and Pope uh, in Catholic world, which is absolutely not the case because it's, it's absolutely uh, uh, does not correspond to the Islamic principles. And Saudi state, by the way, is very recent. But um, so for Muslim Brotherhood, either it was a case in Egypt or it is uh, a case with Palestinians, eventually you would need caliph. Eventually there will be one huge united Islamic state, not anymore like just boundaries of Palestine, uh, Palestine or, or, or boundaries of, of Saudis, um, but, but a huge, well, whole Levant and, and uh, eventually even more than that, like historical caliphates well. So um, I don't expect that Turkey, however, they have embraced largely this uh, uh, religious agenda um, and, and it's, it's, it's much more favored than it used to be. For example, I was there for NATO summit so many years ago in Istanbul and it was extremely secular uh, at that time. It's not anymore. It's, it's, I mean, religion plays increasingly uh, more uh, high role in, uh, in Turkey. But nonetheless, Hamas and Islamic, uh, uh, like uh, those currents, which are like uh, exemplified here by Muslim Brotherhood, it is not for their benefit because eventually that would undermine their own credibility, uh, their own sort of, you know, power base. Uh, thank you. Oof, this has been, a, as you said, a very complex uh, situation and, 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 and a topic. And sadly, we're nearing the end of uh, uh, the time. And maybe that perhaps there are some remarks you want to like give that I didn't ask or a prediction before we end. You know, I just remember like it was, uh, I think, uh, two weeks ago. Uh, 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 public radio, uh, our public radio company in, in, in Latvia, Latvian radio, they have also channel in Russian for Russian speakers and they occasionally interview me on different subjects uh, related uh, to the Middle East and, and they asked me that, that for them it seemed, you know, as it sometimes is for people in the media, they seem to all know that this will this will go on and the tensions will flare up even more and eventually there will be apparently full scale war. And, and they asked me predictions and I said, well, uh, I, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not the person to predict because one thing you surely know if you start to study those things is, is you know, stop all those predictions at the door, you know. But uh, they said, well, is it really to go, going to be a war? Because it increasingly looks like that. I said, well, 
I cannot subscribe to that, not even uh, in the least, because um, everything depends on a decision. And if decision is made among the parties uh, that have influence there, so the conflict might stop almost immediately, you know, in no time. Uh, anyway, I was right. Uh, well, I, I was right, of course, um, but, um, and it's one of those many things which is brokered by Egypt. But uh, in the long run, we are still back to square number one. We still have to return largely. I, I know it sounds terrible for, for, for a lot of, you know, Western players, but we still at least have to reconsider. Are we still talking about two-state solution? And if we are talking about two-state solution, so when it can really come into being, because those uh, lengthy roadmaps with different stipulations from parties involved, you know, um, um, prerequisites Israelis asks, uh, uh, Israeli ask from Palestinians, you know, something to be fulfilled in order to go one step further. And uh, while they are doing that step, something else happens, you know, it leads us nowhere. Naturally, Israel also knows and feels that two-state solution is still not the solution because Palestinians want their country as they see it entirely for themselves. So uh, that's also something to be um, remembered. But there is one more development which has... Um, projection onto the situation in the uh, Palestinian-Israeli conflict. And that's uh, where our relationships are at, at what state with Iran, uh, with Iran largely, because um, the more we will embrace Iran, um, the more nervous uh, Israel would feel, uh, the more perhaps um, momentum will be felt in Palestinian territories. On the other hand, not embracing Iran means uh, that Iran will uh, again use its own leverage and uh, its own means of influence and again, manipulates that, that conflict. But there is one more aspect which is uh, slipping out of our attention. Because even, well, okay, with Iran, some, some scholars and observers notice that and know that uh, vector. And after all, we see that uh, uh, conflict in Yemen is not uh, any more dominating headlines. But there is another actor and that's Russia. And since we know that uh, Palestinian organizations and their uh, backings are also in Lebanon and Syria, and we know of the increasing role Russia is playing there and Iran is also playing there, and especially with the same uh, organizations, we will have to ask much more uncomfortable questions. And, and I'm afraid that sooner or later, even if we don't want to, we will be forced to sit uh, again, to sit down by the negotiation table. Perhaps that's the thing which uh, those big key players are looking for. And for them, um, throwing civilians uh, one against another and seeing more deaths and seeing uh, uh, colorful uh, headlines and uh, and uh, terrible pictures coming from the Middle East is not a big deal because uh, because their eventual aim is really to sort of you know satisfy their own ambitions. So perhaps it's better that we don't wait uh, while we really get into that point, but really sit down with those key players. I think those key players like Turkey, uh, Turkey, uh, Russia. Iran, one thing they are after is acknowledging their being. Well, 
that's a fact. They are there. Maybe, maybe there are some sort of negotiations possible. Maybe not. I'm, I'm not insisting that, that there are easily solutions at all. In a way, I think the genius of um, Israelis is in fact in, in the fact of not waiting for tomorrow. Because like uh, Western mindset would be, oh, like, you know, ju just wait, just wait a little bit. Then we decide, then, then, then we reach that point and this point. And the Israelis know for sure that if you want, first of all, your state, uh, second, uh, to do that state more or less in favor for, for, for sort of, you know, citizens, that it's really habitable. Not like Gaza Strip, by the way, because it's, it's the situation is really dire. So you you cannot you you cannot wait while those big players you know start talking, negotiating, and find a common ground. And and I believe that's a problem. But I don't know where to go from 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 here. That's that's only my fear that some of the key players are waiting for their uh, time and turn to be invited by the big sort of global <laughs> negotiation table. And while we wait, people are going to die. But it doesn't mean necessarily that if they sit, if they sit by that table, that something good or productive would come out of it, and that people would not die. Yep, a uh, food, a uh, uh, thought for food, food for thought. Uh, but thank you very much, Frederick, for giving the interview. Thank you. It has been a pleasure. All the pleasure was mine. <laughs> thank you. <laughs>